Chandrasekhar had gone to Cape Bridge to do his PhD and uh, he was working with Fowler and he tried to calculate the mass of the white ball. But actually the story began even earlier because Chandra had met Sommerfeld who did the whole degeneracy idea in metals, who worked on the motion of electrons inside a metal and how they have this electron degeneracy. And Sommerfeld was visiting Calcutta and Madras and Chandrasekhar met him. And this idea was in his head and while he was traveling by ship from India to Cambridge in England, he was thinking about it and he got the idea that there must be some kind of a mass limit. When he came to Cambridge with the help of Fowler, he was able to start on this problem and he showed there was indeed a mass limit to the white dwarf. The thermal pressure produced by electron degeneracy pressure cannot really balance gravitation if the star has a very high mass. It can only balance gravitation if the mass is less than one and a half times the mass of the sun. This is what is called the Chandrasekhar limit and uh, this was Chandrasekhar's achievement uh, almost for his PhD, you can say, in the early 1930s. Some of you may have heard there is a lot of controversy about this because the big astronomer and astrophysicist in Cambridge was, of course, Eddington. And Eddington supported Chandra all along during his calculations of white dwarf. But finally, when Chandrasekhar presented the mass limit, Eddington changed his mind and he thought this cannot be true. His only argument was, supposing a star starts with a mass much greater than the mass of the sun, say four or five times the mass of the sun, what will happen to it? Chandra said, I don't know the answer. But Eddington said, since we don't know the answer, this cannot be true. There must be something else possible. And of course, this played, this controversy played a very big role in Chandrasekhar's life. And what happened was, around 1936 or 37, Chandrasekhar therefore decided to stop the study of stellar structure. He wrote a book on stellar structure and went on to study stellar dynamics. But that's a different part of the story. But for our purposes, the white dwarf is able to stabilize itself because the electron degeneracy pressure is balancing the gravitation. Let's see. This is the photograph of Chandra Shekhar. Chandra was born in 1910. So this is his birth centenary year. And there will be celebrations going on all over the country. And there's a special celebration at Chicago. And Chandra Shekhar spent all his life in Chicago from 1936 to 1995. Mm -hmm. Almost 60 years he was in Chicago. And, uh, this year we are celebrating the centenary, Chicago has a celebration and celebrations are planned in Bangalore, Delhi, Bombay, etc. But the first, of course, Chandrasekhar did many other great things also, we will come to some of them later on. But the first thing that really made Chandra famous was the Chandrasekhar limit as it is called. It is about one and a half times the mass of the sun, which is the limit beyond which white dwarf cannot have a mass. Now we come to the other two endpoints of the star. If a star cannot form a white dwarf, what else can it form? Now we know that it can form either a neutron star or a black hole. If we suppose the initial star had a mass of about five solar masses, when the whole process of nuclear fuel use finishes, that is when the fuel is finished and there is no fuel left, the star really explodes in an extraordinary way. It is called a supernova. So any star which is slightly more massive than mass of the sun will not quietly end up as a white dwarf, but it will explode like a supernova. And the supernova will produce at its core either of the two objects. Either it will be a neutron star or it will be a black hole. A neutron star will be formed if the star is about four to five solar masses. These Mass values are approximate. You can make them more precise by going into nuclear structure theories. And for each nuclear structure theory, you will produce a different kind of a mass. And later on in this series, you will also hear, I think, Alak Rehi is talking about supernovae. So he will tell you more about supernovae, etc. Now, supposing the initial mass of the star was 5, it becomes a neutron star. Now, can neutron star have any mass? No. Again, the Pauli principle or the degeneracy pressure inside the neutron star is also not limitless. It can only support a gravitation of about three solar masses. 
This depends on the nuclear structure theories, and we are not very completely sure about how nuclear matter behaves at very high densities. But we can say quite confidently that if the mass is greater than three times the solar mass, even a neutron star cannot support the gravitational attraction. So gravitation will win the war and go on contracting the star. So a neutron star also has a limiting mass. So you can ask the question that Eddington asked. Supposing the initial star had a greater mass, then what happens? The initial mass of the star, if it is greater than 10 solar masses, the core becomes what we now call a black hole. Now, Chandrasekhar's idea of limiting mass of the white dwarf, therefore, forces you to consider an object which you call black hole. This object, which came up into consideration right at that time, really got accepted only about 10 years ago. So it took almost 50 years after that for the idea of black hole to be accepted. And black hole has also become an extremely important and interesting and fascinating object, as we will see later on. Now, for a black hole, there is no limiting mass, because black hole really is evidence of the victory of gravitation. Gravitation has won. And after that, it is gravitation which totally dominates black hole. And you can have any mass you want. But after gravitation wins and completely crushes the star, what happens? Unfortunately, we cannot answer this. Because this is an area of strong gravity where quantum gravity has to be used. And we have no idea what quantum gravity will do. But we do know something which helps us to go ahead and discuss this whole object. Next one. Oh, before I go to that, let me show you the Sirius back again. This is Sirius star, the bright, one of the brightest stars in the sky. It is also called the eye of the dog because Canis means dog. Canis major constellation looks like a dog, they say. And this is the eye of the dog. So it is very prominent. You can see it in the sky very easily and strongly recommend you try to see it. And next to that is the, this is called Sirius A and this is called Sirius B. Sirius B is a white dwarf star and it is bright because it is really not cooled off yet. It has got about 100 million degrees of temperature. And it is not cooled off. And the cooling time of a white dwarf is very, very large compared to the life of the universe itself. So there are many, many white dwarfs in the universe which are still cooling. And the study of cooling itself is an extremely interesting study. Next slide. Yeah, so I talked about Sirius B and the white dwarf. And uh, very important characteristic about white dwarf, it is very dense because it has condensed. The size of the white dwarf is about the size of the Earth, that is about 6,000 to 10,000 kilometers. Whereas the mass of the white dwarf is mass of the Sun. So if you take the Sun and crush it to the size of the Earth, then you can see what happens. It is going to be extremely dense. So white dwarf is extremely dense object and uh, it, its core can be either helium, but usually it is not helium, it is either carbon or oxygen. And in some cases, it can also be the next one, that is neon, I think. Now, Sirius A is a normal star, as I told you earlier. And Sirius B, which has been known for a long, long time, is the white dwarf. One of the first white dwarfs, which was identified and seen as white dwarf. There is also another one called A.B. Eridani, which is also a white dwarf. But Sirius B is quite famous by itself. 